Thank you for visiting Pastor Wyatt TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWyatt.com. Legend himself, Frankie Dettori. Ciao, Frankie. Tutta posto. Tutta posto, yes, that's well. a good start. <laughs> so you haven't, you, you haven't lost your Italian. Frankie Dettori, legend, world-class jockey, one of the best ever to sit in the saddle, ambassador to the sport of kings. Meet Frankie during his fanfare like never before, only on Pass the Wire TV. Watch this guy, it's amazing. He does not miss one single detail. Hello, everybody, and welcome to an absolutely special episode of uh, Past the Wire TV. We have a man needs no introduction. I call him the consummate professional, Todd Pletcher. Um, been doing it at the highest level for a long time. Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course, my pleasure. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's funny. You watch a guy's career progress. And you watch them get to the pinnacle of the game, which there's no arguing that, you, you know, you have done and then done again and then done again. And you just get you feel like you get to know them and you get to know certain things about them. So there's a couple of things I want to get into. But before that, uh, let's talk a little bit about Forte. Um, Kentucky Derby contender, probably, you know, arguably the top of the class, won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Um, How's he doing, first of all? How's, how's, how's he, he progressing from two to three? He's doing great. Uh, after the Breeders' Cup, he went to uh, Stone Street, Nocala, and Ian Brennan and his team did a really good job with him, freshened him up a little bit, put some weight on him. You know, he's a leggy colt. He's a tall, athletic colt, but he's much like his stallion violence. He's, he's, he's slender and, and streamlined, and, and uh, so, you know, that's part of our focus is – He's trying to get him to gain a little bit of weight while still getting him ready for a, you know, a good campaign. Right now, he's had three solid work since he came back. He'll go five eights again this weekend and uh, puts him in position to have three more works before what uh, likely will be his first target in the Fountain of Youth on March 4th. So, so maybe two races before the Derby? Is that the, is that the plan at this point? That's the plan right now would be, you know, the Fountain of Youth and depending on how that goes, gives us the option of looking at, you know, all the final round preps. But I would say it would be right now, we'd be thinking between the Florida Derby, which gives them an extra week to the Kentucky Derby, or if we felt like we needed another week, we could wait for the bluegrass and, you know, he's two for two at Keeneland. So right. knock on wood, everything's going smoothly and, you know, we're, we're on schedule. So let me, let me ask you this, you, you know, the, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile obviously is a race that if you've got a top two-year-old, you want to win, you know, but it hasn't been what we would call um, a high producer of, of derby winners. Is there anything you do differently 
with that in mind, prepping a cult from two to three and from the Breeders' Cup juvenile winner to the, to, to, to the Derby winner. Is there anything that you might tweak or do a little differently because of that statistic that kind of jumps off the page that, you know, just so few, you know, juvenile winners have won the Derby? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, I mean, that obviously when you have a horse doing as well as he was in the fall of the year and you've won the Breeders' Futurity and, and you got the Breeders' Cup, you know, I would certainly never not run in the Breeders' Cup thinking that that's going to compromise my chances in the Derby. Derby's a super hard race to win. You can look at a number of different preps that, you know, horses that have won and then have not been able to win the Kentucky Derby. So I don't get too caught up in that. The main thing is we just wanted to freshen them up a little bit to prep campaign in mind. We can have some flexibility if we need it. And, uh, you know, so far everything's gone according to plan. He's a happy horse. He's doing great. Sounds good. Um, all the, all, all the best. Excited, excited to see, excited to see him run for, for all of you and all the connections. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what, what, what I thought was an impressive comeback by, by, by charge it a horse that created a, a, a tremendous amount of buzz. And when, when it, when it went, when he ran in the Florida Derby last year, I thought, um, I thought he was the best horse and just lacked a little bit of seasoning might've been a little green coming down to the wire. And like my comment after the race is these horses will never beat that horse again, going forward. Um, had a setback, you know, had that monster win, you know, and then had a setback, comes back. I thought looked super impressive. What was your take on, on, on the race? And do you view him as, as, as a possible leading contender in the older horse division this year? No, I totally agree with you in the Florida Derby. I, I thought we ran the best horse. We just didn't have a, a horse that was seasoned enough and kind of knew how to polish it off. You know, he kind of wandered all over the track down the lane and, and, you know, we knew we were playing catch up and, but, you know, we we're in a position, he went to Churchill, he trained great there, uh, disappointing outcome in that race, but we regrouped and then we had the monster win in the Dwyer. And unfortunately he grabbed a quarter in that race that, that we just, we, we, we battled with all the way until Travers time and just, you know, we couldn't, couldn't quite get there. So gave him some time off. He went back to, to Whisper Hill Farm in Ocala and, and got him healed up. And Todd Quas sent him back to us with a couple of works under his belt. And, you know, he was he was just getting ready really quickly. So we decided to give him a little more experience running the allowance race. And, and hopefully, you know, the idea would be the our two first real big goals are the Met Mile and the, and the Whitney. And, you know, I think he has enough potential to, to be as good as anyone in the, in the division right now. Well, I'm surprised the Met Mile. I would, I, 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 I would have thought you might have kept him around two turns, but you think he's fast enough to go to go that 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 one turn Met Mile. And the way he ran in the Dwyer at Belmont around one turn, yeah, I, I love that race. All right, and, 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 and interesting. Uh, one one of the things I always wondered about you, and 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 you, you know, maybe it's as simple as who comes by in the morning and who's working, who and whatnot, but. You use a, a lot of top riders, and you seem to be very fair as to giving a lot of the a lot, a lot of the riders a chance to ride. Um, you, you, you know, you're not probably somebody who, if I was an agent, obviously I'm not that I would be afraid to approach and ask for a shot, even though you're on the uh, upper level, because you seem to give people a shot. But how is it that you pick? a rider for certain horses. Like a lot of times you'll see, you know, you've got two in there and, you know, a, a rider's on one that was riding another. Do you look at the rider style in, in comparison with the, with, with the horse? Is it not that scientific? Is it just, you know, the ride, do you leave it to the riders or how, how does that all play out in your barn? Well, a lot of it depends on availability and scheduling and, you know, especially what we're going to see in the next couple of months, there's going to be a lot of guys going out of town for prep races and, you know, so it can get a little bit tricky, but, you know, we'll have, we'll have the, the thing about the colony and the, and the group of riders that we use is these guys are all exceptional jockeys and, and at every, at everything they do, you know, they're, they're complete riders. They ride the dirt well. They ride the turf well. They ride, you know, speed horses well. They can come from off the pace. So, you know, we're talking about 
you know, the best jockeys in the world here that, that, that we're fortunate enough to use. So then a lot of times it's about, you know, just maybe certain horses you think will fit certain guys. We've got a lot of times on certain mornings, we'll have four or five jockeys out here breezing horses. And so maybe, you know, they'll get on a two-year-old that, that uh, or, you know, three-year-old at, at this time that that's never run and they work them and then we'll kind of let them stay with that horse, that kind of thing. So, but, uh, you know, I think uh, we like, we like Irad on the turf a lot. You know, I think he's riding the turf, turf course as well as he ever has. And then I think Luis is good on, on horses that, you know, need a little bit of encouragement sometimes and, and horses that like to attend the pace. But, but again, these, these guys are so, so good. They, they can literally do everything. So, you know, we always feel confident, confident if we've got, you know, one of those guys aboard. Yeah, I, I, I can't say I blame you. You know, over the years, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, over the years, I've always found you to be a guy who, like I said, the consummate professional, always on your game, always on top of everything, pay attention to every minute detail. Um, I was at the Breeders' Cup this year out, out in the morning watching you watch your horses train, and no matter how many of them were on the track, just looked like you noticed everything about everyone. And, and I honestly don't know, you know, how, how you're able to do that. Um, but it, it, it is remarkable. And I think it speaks to your success over, over, over longevity and over, you, you know, which I think is one of the things that sets you apart from a, a, a lot of, a lot of great trainers is that longevity at, at, at the highest level. But what I'm wondering about is, if I'm reading something right, there, there are, to me, two moments in your career. And I know that although you play it close to the vest, I'll see every now and then that Todd Pletcher fist pump where that emotion gets, get, get, get you. And I know there's that competitive fire in there, even though you've got that poker face a lot of the time. There were two moments to me that stand out. And one of them, I think, really exudes class because it wasn't your moment. But I'm going to say what they are and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. And then I'm going to ask you what, what was one of the moments for you. Um, but I think when rags to riches won the Belmont, that was a special moment in Todd's career. Okay. Just from me watching your reaction to the win. And I think when Johnny, who you go back a long way with won the Derby on animal kingdom and got that Derby win, um, I saw your little high, high sign to Johnny after the race. Um, and to me, it looked like you were as happy as him for him getting that, that derby win as you'd have been if it was for you or on, 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 on one of your horses. So, A, am I reading those two moments right as being special for you? And I think the one with Johnny, if I'm right, just exudes class because that just shows, you know, the regard you had for – uh, another rider, even though it wasn't on your horse, and uh, rags to riches. Am I right? And then, what are what's one or two really special moments that stand out for you in your remarkable career? No, I think I would agree with you on. You know, certainly, rags to riches was it was it was to me still the most exciting race that that you know we were involved with, and and. You know, so much went into actually deciding to run in the Belmont. And I mean, we had the best three-year-old filly in the country. She's coming off a Kentucky Oaks win. And the conservative thing would have been to keep her with Phillies and, and continue on that path. But, you know, she was, she was bred for the Belmont. She was training really well. And it was our first classic win. But just the, the way the race unfolded, you know, and when she fell on her head, leaving the gate, you know, my first thought was, oh, you made the wrong decision running in here. And, and then it kind of, she creeps back into contention. And then, you know, the, the, the stage is set at the top of the stretch and, and, and her and Curlin were just going, you know, back and forth. So many, so many emotions go through your mind in that final 24 seconds and think you're going to win and think the other horse is going to come back. And it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was such an exciting race. And, you know, I remember for a long time after that, being in airports or someone, you know, seeing someone come up to me and say, man, that was, I was, you know, on top of my couch, jumping up and down during that race. And 
Uh, I can't tell you how many people have made comments like that. And of course, you know, with, with Animal Kingdom, that was that was the year of Uncle Mo, and and you know, we had a late defection with him. He was sick, and so you know, Johnny was able to to pick up the mount on Animal Kingdom, and you know, it was great. I was very happy for him, and just one of many now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ex ex exactly. Um, were you ever frustrated by? Um, your record in the Derby not being what some people thought it would be. I mean, I, I think anyone who criticizes anyone who's got a, a one for uh, or all for or, or, or just has been in the Derby that, that criticizes it really, really doesn't understand the magnitude of what it takes to get to the race, let alone win it. Now you've got your wins um, and, you know, no, God willing, there's more, 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 more roses with your name on them. But was it ever frustrating you to read people uh, critique your record in the Derby at any point when it wasn't what they maybe thought it should be? Yeah, of course. You know, I'm a competitive guy and, you know, I'd like to be 10 for 10 in it. But, <laughs> you know, realistically, I, I think, you know, we did a, a really good job of getting a lot of horses there. And, and to be honest, we took a lot of horses and probably didn't didn't have a real chance but you know at the same time when you look at it it's so meaningful to the owners and, and, the, and the people associated with the horses and, uh, to take that opportunity I mean, the, the one good thing I can say about our, our derby record is I've never left a potential derby winner in the stall you know we, we took our shot every time and and uh, you know the, the stats are a little skewed because you know we ran ran multiple horses in a lot of derbies and clearly not all of them could win. So it makes it makes the numbers look a little perhaps worse than they actually are. But you know, we're, we're pretty grateful to to have two of them. Yeah, no, I I mean and 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 you know at the end of the day when you're realistic about it, you know, two derby one derby win is is, is phenomenal. I mean when, and when you put that with all the other wins, I really I really don't see how anybody could say anything because when, when you look at the Derby, I mean, and you go historically and look back at it, Todd, I mean, so many horses just didn't fire um, over the years. So many came out of the Derby to be great horses and just didn't run their race that day. The best horse doesn't always win. It takes the best horse getting the right trip for that day and a couple of breaks have to go their way. I mean, if you get a couple of breaks against you in the Derby, it's almost impossible to overcome them. Um, you, you know, I mean, there's, there's horses on my list in my mind that, you know, had this happened, had that happened, you know, this horse might've won, that horse might've won, yep. and, you, you, know, you know, so this, I think the stats are skewed in, in, in those ways as well. Sure. I mean, there's been some unbelievable horses that have, have not, not fired on that day and, and come back and done terrifically like the holy bull comes to mind you know right. running the holy bull this past weekend is a good example of that exactly. and uh yeah it can it, there there's something different about it you know the atmosphere and and uh you know the i think the intensity level and you know some horses you know kind of maybe internally melt down a little bit in that scenario you know people people laugh at me a lot of times because everybody if you say who was the second best horse in in secretariat's kentucky derby 99 out of 100 people are going to shout out Shan, you know, and I argue against it. I'm like, well, I, I say that's debatable. I mean, he ran the second fastest. I, I know all of that, but Forgo was in that race and we all know what Forgo turned into. I mean, right. you, you know, so, you know, I would argue Forgo was, might've been the second best horse in that in Kentucky Derby, certainly accomplished a lot more than Shan due, due to injury. But I, I, I mean, so it's just really, really a, a crazy race. Um, you're a competitive guy, like you said. You train for two very competitive guys. Um, Vinny and Mike are, are, are super competitive, gentlemen like yourself. Um, is that more pressure training for guys like that or less pressure because they're so understanding of everything that goes into the game or because of your nature? Is it like, hey, these guys are as competitive as I am. I want to win for them. Does it put more pressure or less pressure on you as an individual? I, I don't think either. I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, we put pressure on ourselves all the time. That's, you know, that's what drives us and we want to want to succeed. So, you know, of course, when you got guys like that, that support you and provide you with the kind of horses that they're giving us, 
we have high expectations. They have high expectations, and we all want to we all want to do well. And it's <clears throat> but at the same time, we don't take for granted. You know, it's 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 not easy. You know, we got to work hard at it. And uh, but uh, you know, they they they're great guys to have support you, and you know, we're, we're fortunate to be part of the team. Last question I'm going to ask you is this, Todd. Um, and again, I appreciate your time, but how early? And, and it's a general question. How early in a horse's career does Todd Pletcher spot one of these two-year-olds or, 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 or one of these newly turned three-year-olds that might have not started as at, at two? How early and what prompts you to whip out the cell phone and call the owner and say, hey, we may really have a, 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 a special one here. We may have a, a, an Uncle Mo type uh, you know, how early does that happen? And what is it that you see? Is it just the fast work? Is it how they move, how they go? Is it the intelligence? What is it that you spot that you can share that, that makes you take out that cell phone and say, hey, we, we may have one here? Yeah, well, uh, sometimes you'll, you'll get some feedback from the, from the training centers where they are. I remember when Scat Daddy was, was still a yearling back in December, I was I would talk to my dad a lot of times early in the morning and uh, while I was driving to Palm Meadows and we were talking, I asked him, I said, how's the, that Johannesburg colt that we bought at Keeneland doing? He said, this might be the best horse we've ever had on the farm. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's only, it's only not even two yet. And, right. But it seems like the good ones, you know, he said the same thing with more than ready and English channel. And a lot of the, a lot of the good ones kind of tip themselves early on and, and, but when we get them in, we, we've seen, you know, some that, that will fool you in the mornings when you're, when you're going a quarter or three eighths. And, and uh, then when you, you get stretched out, um, they don't do as well. So um, <clears throat> we usually reserve judgment. I love to see that good five eighths before we, before we really know for sure. All right, man. Hey, Todd, I appreciate it. I know you're busy. I thank you for coming on the show. I promise we keep it quick and, and, and lively. I think we did that. Um, all the best to you um, leading up to the Derby. Uh, let's get there probably with a couple and uh, we'll, we're, we're always rooting for you and excited to see Charger throughout the year. I mean, he, he, he like I said, after that Florida Derby, I'm like, He'll, they'll, these horses will never beat this this, this horse again. So maybe maybe we'll get to see this year what he can what he can really do. So I hope so. All right, thank All you man. very much. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate you. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Hi, everybody. Dan Oman here with some exciting news. DRF Formulator, the gold standard in past performance information, is now free exclusively on DRF Bets. Join DRF Bets with the promo code WINNING. Get a $250 first deposit match bonus, a $10 free bet, and free Formulator already uploaded to your account. Access Formulator's premium features, including sortable trainer stats, race replays, personalized trip notes, and lots more. Free Formulator, exclusively on DRF Bets. Tracking trips with Pick 6 King, John Stetton. It's one of the best tools in horse racing for any level of player. It's your second set of eyes. Spotting troubled trips, betting angles, track trends. Horses to watch and favorites to fade. 10 fakes, ticket structure, and more. At Tracking Trips, you're a friend with benefits. Not a member? You must hate winning money. Join Tracking Trips now. Visit PassTheWire.com and we'll see you in the winner circle. Remember, nobody does it better. Nobody does it better.